Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's debate. My name is Bella and I am the chair lady and Kirby is the timekeeper. The adjudicator is Mr. Morton and the, tonight, the topic of tonight's debate is that we should unfriend Facebook. The affirmative team is seated to my right is from Mercedes College and the negative team seated to my left is from Courtney Grammar School. The speaking time for this debate is eight minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time. Ding. And a double bell will sound <laughs> at the speaking time. A continuous bell may be rung 30 seconds after the speaking time, in which case the speaker must sit down immediately. Please ensure that your mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched off. I declare this debate open and call upon the first affirmative speaker, Henry. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's quarterfinal debate. The topic for this debate is that we should unfriend Facebook, and we, the affirmative team, will be convincing you of this tonight. In terms of the definition, we define the topic as it is the, in the best interests of both individuals and society that the Facebook-using population cease their usage upon the platform. We would also like to clarify that tonight we define Facebook as exclusively the platform, not including its daughter companies such as Instagram and WhatsApp. So to establish our team case, I'll be speaking about two main points tonight, which both fall into the theme of wider societal implications of Facebook usage. The first of those points being the threats to security and privacy. And my second point revolves around the negative impact Facebook has on media and the access to legitimate information. My second speaker, Kathy, will then tackle the repercussions Facebook usage has on the individual, including the harm to mental and physical health, as well as negatively influencing the ways in which we communicate with others. I will now move on to my first point. Given the inherent nature of creating a profile, we give Facebook information about us, private information that we implicitly trust Facebook to keep to itself. Some would call it naive to assume Facebook's good intentions, yet if Facebook was truly a platform with whom we should remain friends, we should not have to feel sceptical and constantly wary about the safety of our data. Unfortunately, this is the reality in which we live. Cambridge Analytica was the scandal that rocked Facebook in recent years as 50 million Facebook users' addresses, profiles, phone numbers, likes and even exact GPS locations were all collected by a third party, Cambridge Analytica, in order to construct a detailed profile that can be exploited for political gain. Many people were surprised to learn that this all occurred completely legally within Facebook's data sharing policy. There was no systematic break-in, technical bypass or flaw in software. An article in Recode states that this all happened just as Facebook intended it to happen. All of this data collection followed the company's rules. All of this evidence makes it increasingly clear that Facebook didn't care for the individual user. Facebook would have us believe, through its extensive rehabilitative public image campaign, that it's all fine now. They've reformed their policies and strengthened their users' privacy. And at first it seemed that way, as Facebook released more extensive information about data collection within the settings page. However, upon further inspection, nothing had really changed. This is the official statement from Facebook. We're not asking for any new rights to collect, use or share your Facebook data. We're also not changing any privacy choices you've made in the past. In other words, Facebook is changing how much it tells people, but is not changing how much it collects from people or how much it protects people. Even Facebook employee Sander Paracolis, whose specialty was monitoring data breaches by third-party software, warned senior Facebook officials that its relaxed, turn-a-blind-eye approach to data protection placed all of its platform users at risk of a data breach. Facebook's apology was not genuine. To our face, they said sorry and that they would never betray us again, but they continue to allow data breaches to occur. Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica is just one example. Sandy stated that data breaches occur on the daily, yet Facebook isn't taking the steps to resolve it. That certainly doesn't sound like a particularly good friend. I will now move on to my second point, which is that, by design, Facebook has diluted legitimate media sources and made it more difficult to distinguish between accurate information. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the term clickbait, and if not, you've most certainly seen it. Clickbait is the exaggerated titles that can't possibly be true, but you seem to be drawn to regardless. The Facebook algorithm, which determines what news story posts and cat videos on your timeline, feeds off of this clickbait. Facebook decides which bits of information you are privy to based on the engagement of other users as well as data collected from your own use. According to the conversation, me media publishers report that 80% of their digital traffic comes from Facebook. On the surface, this seems great. 
News is able to reach a larger audience in a faster time period. However, Facebook has broken down the traditional distinction between professional news gathering and amateur rumour mongering. Did you know there are over a hundred aggressively pro-Trump media websites being run out of a small town in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia? The sites with seemingly legitimate names such as US Conservative Today were actually posting entirely fabricated stories with catchy conservative headlines. Journalists from the BBC tracked one of these fake news stories on Facebook to see it had amassed over 200,000 shares in just one week. This is just one of the countless examples on Facebook of false yet engaging content spreading quickly throughout the algorithm decided audience. The teenagers running these false Facebook promoted websites are quoted in saying they don't actually care about American politics. Rather, they're simply exploiting the economic incentive of Facebook AdSense. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the advertising system of Facebook rewards fake news. The way in which Facebook distributes media is insidious. It's all well and good when we're in the right frame of mind to critically analyse information, yet when we're bombarded constantly by illegitimate sources as Facebook facilitates, it disrupts the way in which we analyse media. Now, the student continues saying that, yes, the information in the blogs is bad, false and misleading, but the rationale is if it gets people to click on it and engage with it, then use it. However, we should not be complacent with this viewpoint. We deserve to trust our news sources and gain an accurate understanding of the world around us. Excuse the cliché, but with great power comes great responsibility. And currently Facebook has a great power over the media sources with which we are being presented, yet it is not taking the great responsibility seriously. Rather, it is perpetuating the dangers of fake news to maximise engagement and receive revenue from AdSense. So, ladies and gentlemen, what makes a good friend? A friend is someone you can trust, someone you can tell your secrets to, knowing they will remain a secret. Yet Facebook has violated this trust again and again with undeniable data mining and privacy scandals. A friend is someone who is honest and will tell you the truth when you need it. Yet the design of Facebook promotes blatant lies. But ultimately, a friend is someone who will always have your best interests at heart. And frankly, Facebook currently does not, which is why we should unfriend them. Thank you. I call upon the first negative speaker, Tom Clark. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom Clapp and I am the first speaker for the negative team. The topic for tonight's debate is that we should unfriend Facebook. However, we, the negative team, wholeheartedly disagree with the topic. We agree with the definition given by the affirmative team. Now, today, as first speaker, 
I will be discussing two main points this evening. My first point is that Facebook is a great organisation and communication tool. Facebook is also a great platform which is capable of making younger teenagers more conscientious of social issues and encourage them to make changes. Our second speaker, Olivia, will talk to you about the benefits of being able to reach a wide audience with Facebook, particularly a large number of mutual friends with ease. She will also talk about the changes Facebook is implementing to make a better experience for its users. Finally, our third speaker, Zach, will rebut and sum up our team's case. Before continuing with my arguments, I will point out some flaws in the opposition's case. The first affirmative speaker has tried to tell you that Facebook is a threat to our privacy. They said nothing has really changed after previous scandals. This is not entirely true, as I outlined later in my speech. I outlined Facebook is making changes to their machine learning capabilities, improving their effect on the spread of fake news and other threats to security. This is a process that takes time. Machine learning does not happen overnight. The first affirmative speaker has also tried to tell you that clickbait is a problem. Though this may be the case for some areas, it is possible to cross-reference the information found on Facebook with other more reputable websites for validity. This teaches us valuable cross-referencing skills, as I will also explain later in my speech. Tonight, I will be speaking about two main points. My first point is that Facebook keeps us connected and helps keep us organised. We all know Facebook is a massive company. According to information from the company itself, there is a massive user base for the platform. An average of 1.47 billion people log in daily. That is a lot of people using Facebook. Facebook is a great organiser for a lot of people. The platform is easily used to create events that other people can see. Let's say you are trying to easily create a dinner with a group of 30 people. Instead of trying to work out a date and exact time with everyone, the owner simply sets up an event using Facebook. They put all the details into one place and it is easily accessible for everyone invited, where they can find out all the information they require for their dinner. However, the best way Facebook keeps us connected is which the speed it can be used to communicate. When something important happens in the world, someone who has just heard about these events sends someone else a message through Messenger, alerting them to what has happened. Facebook users also have the share functionality, sharing news with their friends. This means important information is spread easily and instantaneously. The days of waiting to hear all your news, all your information on the 6 o'clock news is long gone. And this is thanks to the way Facebook can connect us. With this in mind, people become more aware of the issues around us. Now, I know you may all be thinking about fake news. Once people find out news on Facebook, they can use other news sites to validate the information they find. This teaches its users valuable cross-referencing techniques that they can apply in the future. Facebook is also making changes currently to combat fake news. Facebook is currently expanding its fact-checking program using machine learning, as per information released by the company. Users on Facebook are in continuous communication with one another. Facebook is constantly used to keep in touch with old friends and family living across a great distance. When someone lives a long way away from close friends or family, Facebook is used by millions for communication. Updating posts is easy on Facebook, allowing people to see what you've been up to even if they do live a long way away. Facebook's Messenger app is one of the most effective ways to talk to others, as it not only is instantaneous, but it is free as well. With the fast, easy and effective communication and connectivity Facebook allows, unfriending would simply not be preferable. My second point tonight is that Facebook has made young people more conscious to current social issues. This can encourage them to make changes for the better. Unfortunately, there are plenty of items that get brought up in the media, all for the wrong reasons. Facebook is an excellent way for teenagers who may not always watch the news to keep up with the current issues. More importantly, Facebook can encourage teenagers to make changes for the better. There is no better example of this than Joyce Poller from New South Wales. The 14-year-old lost her mother as a result of domestic violence. She created a petition. This petition was lobbying for domestic violence uh, lessons to be a part of the curriculum in New South Wales school. This petition was all over the internet, 
but in particular, all over Facebook. This allowed her to connect with a huge range of people, giving her petition the maximum exposure possible. It eventually gained enough exposure, thanks to Facebook, to be taken to the Premier, who proceeded to change the curriculum to include mandatory lessons on domestic violence. Joyce has said, if domestic violence was addressed within the public school's educational criteria, I could have gotten help and saved my mum. Though she may not have been able to save her mum with this petition, her desire to create change certainly could help save someone else's life. From the sharing power of Facebook, this became a possibility. Though sharing may not be exclusive to Facebook, only Facebook can share news in this manner. Other platforms cannot share news as rapidly as Facebook. Things can be spread extremely quickly, as it can reach a high number of people very fast. Facebook was behind this significant social change. <coughs> this is a clear example of where Facebook has exposed teenagers to issues such as these, allowing them to take a stand for what they believe is right. This is an important reason why Facebook should not be unfriended. So, ladies and gentlemen, Facebook is one of the best communication tools that we have. Facebook allows us to stay organised easily, as well as connected with our friends with ease. It also can help us make young people more conscientious and in tune with current events. With those points in mind, it is clear Facebook is a helpful website and that it should not be unfriended. I call upon the second affirmative speaker, Kathy Dunn. In its 2004 foundation, Facebook's mission was to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. People use Facebook to stay connected with friends and family, to discover what's going on in the world, and to share and express what matters to them. But at what cost? The topic for tonight's debate is that we should unfriend Facebook. We, the affirmative team, unequivocally agree with this statement, as we see the cost of Facebook's dream as way too great. Our first speaker, Henry, has discussed the adverse effects of Facebook on society, including the dangers of fake news and data mining. Today, I wish to expand upon the negative effects experienced by individuals that are currently friends with Facebook. These effects are cyberbullying, mental health, um, advertising, and criminal activity. Before I discuss these points, I'd like to address some of the opposition's points. The negative team have stated that Facebook is a good communicative tool. Alongside many social media, Facebook is indeed a platform designed for communication. However, this particular platform has a vast number of negative implications such as privacy issues, fake news and mental health concerns which significantly outweigh its, communica its communicative aspect. They've also mentioned uh, that Facebook makes us more conscious of social issues. However, as our first speaker spoke about in more depth, the sheer overwhelming amount of clickbait, false information and fake news, only good for ad revenue, dilute our ability to rely on current event information. 
Facebook spent $3.1 million um, lobbying against the Honest Ads Act that sought to impose rules about online political ads and news. They are actually opposed to valid advertising. Uh, now to my main points. Firstly, the question of cyberbullying, a major issue particularly around youth. 88% of 18 to 29 year olds are Facebook users, and as such they make up the largest demographic of both users and also those most targeted by cyberbullying. Every year over 1 million people under the age of 24 have been cyberbullied on Facebook. Every year, non-profit organisations such as Reach Out, Kids Help and Ditch the Label produce more and more distressing statistics in the hope of gaining Facebook's attention. Failing to address these issues, individuals that fall victim to cyberbullying have had to find refuge in the law. Facebook has never introduced any substantive initiatives that have been proven to combat cyberbullying. As such, there are more and more cases being taken to court regarding incidents occurring on Facebook. <coughs> Essentially, the only way in which cyberbullying has been succinctly resolved is through legal suits for hate speech, defamation and harassment. To place this into perspective, Facebook has not reformed correctly at any stage to address the issue of cyberbullying and individuals are forced to take these incidents into their own hands to assure themselves justice. Ladies and gentlemen, what kind of friend wouldn't fight for you, or at least stand up for you if you were being bullied? Significantly related to the issue of cyberbullying is mental health. On average, people spend about 30 minute, 35 minutes on Facebook every day, signing in approximately 8 times every 24 hours. In December 2017, following a conclusive study by Facebook's research scientists, in follow-up to numerous studies by American universities including Michigan, San Diego and Yale, the Yale yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The social media company publicly released a statement regarding the negative effects of Facebook on users, with a spotlight on the youth. Researchers have penned the condition Facebook depression. Facebook depression encompasses the loneliness, anxiety, aggressive attitude, temper and deep sadness that are directly linked to the use of Facebook and its various features. Throughout these various studies, it has been demonstrated that in five minutes of browsing, messaging, commenting or altering profile, one's mood can shift from one extreme to another, with overwhelming evidence that an, indiv that an individual will end up in a foul mood. In response to these conclusive studies, Facebook has promised to consult mental health experts in order to address the problem, prompting features such as meaningful interaction and take a break. Such an oversimplified attempt to fix the problem was not only ineffective but poorly received, with the studies continuing, continuing up as recent as during this year, revealing the exact same correlation between spending time on Facebook and feeling worse. Continuing on the theme of individual aspects on individual impacts on mental health, I would like to briefly discuss the problem of Facebook's advertising. As of April 2018, over 5 million businesses advertise on Facebook, all of which rely upon the specialised form formula that targets individuals based on their profile and general internet searches. In the second quarter of 2017, this advertising earned Facebook a profit of $7.68 billion. Such a profit could be disregarded if its negative impacts on individuals wasn't so extreme. The nature of online advertising leaves the target audience very much vulnerable, and this compounds with Facebook's extremely insufficient regulations regarding bad and misleading ads that have resulted in numerous problems, some of which include the encouragement of gambling amongst youth, as proved by a recent Deakin University study, and the promotion of false political information as discussed by my previous speaker. Finally, the malicious nature of Facebook as a vehicle for digital crimes is unprecedented. The seven most common Facebook crimes include cyberbullying, scams, stalking, robbery, identity theft, defamation and harassment, as defined by the European Union Agency for Network and Information Security. The use of Facebook's platform to commit crimes is no secret to the operators and has long been critiqued by the industry. Following the 2012 revelation that a criminal act is committed every 40 minutes on Facebook, the social media client, client's response was to allow 13-year-old access to their online community. This is extremely counterintuitive and not, as not only did Facebook fail to address the issue of criminal activity on their platform, but they responded by increasing the demographic of potential victims. In the light of Facebook's lack of response, countless attempts have been made by domestic policing bodies to combat cybercrime on Facebook, but to limited success. The only progress that has been successfully combat that has successfully combated any forms of crime is data mining. A terrible irony lies in Facebook's inability to secure our experience, and yet they can easily and actively jeopardize our privacy in the name of turning over more profit. 
The powerhouse of social media that is Facebook should be held to higher standards, forced to cooperate with criminal investigations, and answer for the damage that have, they have caused to society through the individuals that regularly use the online platform. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we cannot allow the actions of Facebook to affect the individual or social climate of our society. For the cumulative reasons presented by our team, we have to stand against the acceptance of Facebook, see past its stream, and unfriend the social media pla platform that has been such a bad friend to us. I call upon the second negative speaker, Olivia Cannon. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. As already stated, the topic up for debate tonight is that we should unfriend Facebook. As the negative team, we do not believe this statement to be true. Our first speaker, Tom, has already explained the multiple benefits Facebook provides to us, such as being a useful tool in our daily lives and pe making people more aware of social issues. As second speaker, I shall be expanding slightly on what Tom has said, in the sense that I shall be explaining how Facebook can be useful in helping people easily and freely reach a wide audience. I shall also be addressing the Cambridge Analytica scandal and how, while yes, this was a mistake, we should not unfriend Facebook over it as they have sincerely apologised and have made changes. But first, I shall but rebut some of the arguments made by the opposition. The second affirmative speaker has stated that Facebook provides a platform where cyberbullying is common. This is wrong because our opposition is illogically assuming that Facebook causes cyberbullying, which is incorrect. There are many other social medias where cyberbullying is present, so to suggest Facebook causes cyberbullying is illogical. Additionally, last month, Facebook had an, an, an anti-cyberbullying day where all of its um, users were presented with anti-cyberbullying messages. Thus, Facebook does not cause cyberbullying. <laughs> Additionally, getting rid of Facebook will unfortunately not fix the problem of uh, cyberbullying because there are many other ways children can bully one another on social media and in real life. A better strategy would be to teach kids not to bully each other. The second speaker said we should not unfriend face said we should unfriend Facebook because of fake news. While the ex recent explosion of face news on Facebook was a ser is a serious problem, Facebook has learnt from this and now uses machine learning to recognise fake news sites and shut them down as, and has reduced the financial incentives for fake news sites. This is what a good friend does, learn from them as their mistakes and this is why should, we should not unfriend Facebook. The first speaker also tried to tell you that data breaches continue to occur daily yet he failed to give any specific examples of privacy breaches and certainly none of the severity of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. On to my points. Firstly, Facebook is our friend as it allows us 
and businesses to reach a wider audience than ever we ever could have before, as it is free for anyone to use. Similar to the sentiment expressed by our first speaker, Tom, Facebook is a useful tool for everyday people to gain signatures for petitions, support for GoFundMe campaigns and other charity fundraisers, and serve as a marketplace for people to buy and sell items like clothes, simply because it allows them to access such a wide audience. Facebook is also a useful tool for businesses as it allows them to advertise to many people for free and communicate directly with their customers through their page, helping them to gain attention without the need for traditional forms of advertising, making Facebook especially beneficial to small and independent businesses. Additionally, this ability to reach a large audience is amplified by the unique design of Facebook as it allows people to easily see what their friends like or are tagging each other in on their newsfeed, exposing people to a wider range of information, which social media, other social media sites such as Instagram do not allow for. The free platform that, platform that Facebook gives us is yet another reason why we should stay friends. My next point is that while what has occurred with Facebook and third-party data collection agencies, most significantly Cambridge Analytica, is undeniably unacceptable, it does not mean we should unfriend Facebook given their apology and the changes they have made. Okay, so a quick rundown. Beginning in 2014, the, data, the political consulting slash data analytics firm, Cambridge Analytica, collected data from Facebook users through a separate survey app for the purpose of using it to design ads to specifically target people and influence their behaviour. Various groups and politicians paid Cambridge Analytica for this information to influence how people voted in the 2016 Brexit vote, the 2018 Mexican general election, and most controversially, the 2016 US presidential election, as Cambridge Analytica worked for the campaign of Donald Trump, who ended up winning the election. According to The Guardian, the information of at least 87 million Facebook users was collected and used. While it is no secret advertisers have been using Facebook information about Facebook users to market their products for a while now, this was on a whole new level as the product being advertised was a potential leader of the USA. Put simply, this was bad. However, Facebook recognises this and accepts responsibility even though they themselves did not try and influence people's behaviour through immoral means, nor did they set out, nor did they consciously set out to promote the, let's say, controversial agenda of Donald Trump. Not only did Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg apologise on CNN and in his testimony to Congress, but Facebook also took out very expensive full-page ads in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and seven other high-profile newspapers to publish an apology letter which included the statement this was a breach of trust and I'm sorry we didn't do more at the time we're now taking steps to make sure this doesn't happen again Facebook has also taken now ad space on websites and even bus stops around Adelaide to share this apology furthermore Facebook has already taken various actions to ensure something of this severity cannot happen again according to CBS Facebook has been redesigned so the settings and privacy menu is easier to find and make changes to, giving people more control over how much Facebook knows about them. Facebook will also no longer allow third-party apps to access personal information about its users, such as their political views or relationship status, and requ now requires more information about the companies who use Facebook data to advertise. They are also now in support of the US's Honest Ads Act from 1989, which requires political ads to disclose who paid for them. Facebook had previously been against this act. Everyone makes mistakes. Even our bestest of friends do things which hurt us sometimes, even though they didn't intend to. When Mark Zuckerberg was developing Facebook in his university dorm, he could not have foreseen its future capability to be abused in the way it was by Cambridge Analytica. No one could have. Nothing like Facebook had ever existed before. When our friends make mistakes, we don't immediately unfriend them. We talk it out, and if they are a good friend, they apologize and promise to do better next time. This is what Facebook has done, and this is why we should not unfriend them. Thank you.
Nicole van de Teur, ik ben nu Steven Kleinwaard. If I may paint you a picture of a bridge over a body of water, this is a bridge that you come across fairly regularly, but have recently discovered its foundations are faulted. Moreover, you have heard that trolls live under this bridge, and the railings have been broken, and the structure is collapsing in places. Ladies and gentlemen, this bridge is Facebook, and you are the individual who must choose, who must choose whether or not to risk it. We as the affirmative team don't believe you should have to or that you should. And that is why tonight we are in complete affirmation of the topic that we should unfriend Facebook. Uh, tonight's debate, um, the definition was agreed um, upon. And just to quickly recap this, um, the, the definitive terms are defined as the best interest um, for both individuals and society that Facebook um, that the, popula that, the, that the population should cease using Facebook as a platform. Um, and tonight, in my role as third speaker, I will be summarising my team's case. However, before I move on to this, I would like to discuss some of the key themes of tonight's debate um, and analyse the propositions made by the negative. So, um, so following the first two speakers um, on the opposition, the themes um, most apparent in tonight's debate are that of the personal relationships that individuals have with Facebook and how it personally affects them, and then the, um, more, uh, the more electronic, the technolo technology side of this debate, um, which includes um, the issues of clickbait, privacy, um, data mining. So to begin with discussing the personal relations, um, tonight there has been discussion surrounding uh, the concept of bullying and as the affirmative we propose that bullying is not an invention created by Facebook but it is of course, a cyberbullying particularly is a huge part of the criminal activity that occurs on Facebook. Um, and whilst we completely acknowledge the opposition sentiments that um, it is not in fact a, a construct of Facebook, there has to be a burden of responsibility placed on Facebook to, um, to put in place affirmative action um, to counter these, um, these incidents of cyberbullying. Um, as my second speaker elaborated, the failure of a lot of the um, schemes and um, proposal days of you know um, cyberbullying awareness days, etc., have really failed to be effective in um, changing the changing the attitudes of people on Facebook, and thus a lot of individuals have been forced to take legal action to ensure justice following these incidents. So this is really highlighting an area of Facebook that no conclusive um, action is being taken, and thus it has to be considered. Um, as to not, not so much as how directly cyberbullying can be combated, but the steps that Facebook takes as um, a social media app to make sure that it minimizes cyberbullying. And um, as the statistics have shown, that just isn't, that just isn't keeping up with the trends of cyberbullying. Um, to further express the issue of personal relations, the second speaker spoke um, in length about the benefits for small businesses um, in how Facebook allows individuals to reach a wider audience, connect with the international community. Um, again, this is a fact that cannot be disputed. Um, it is an international engaging um, and communication service. However, it is the method in which um, such a service is being taken. Again, coming back to the risk and reward analysis we have to take of Facebook's um, implementation of a lot of their programs and their software. So uh, for a small business, yes, there is um, advantages in using uh, a lot of free apps to advertise, but Facebook's management of this um, in comparison to their management of uh, the potential for scamming, the potential for, um, you know, uh, again, the crimes committed that my second speaker mentioned really has to outweigh the gains that it offers for a small business. Um, as they are a small business, they need to protect their revenue, they need to protect their employees, um, and they need to protect their customers as they are a business. Um, finally, just to counter the... Um, 
the sentiments proposed, uh, the sentiments brought up by the um, opposition tonight that Facebook is um, is a social media client that is in those early uh, that is in a stage of you know transitioning because they are attempting to um, correct the wrongs that were that have been brought up in the recent scandals. There has to be acknowledgement made for those that have been involved with Facebook from the beginning um, and for their regrets that they have expressed regarding the direction that the company has taken. So again, it's the acknowledgement of people that were behind a lot of these decisions that have seen Facebook fail to um, uphold the good judgement of what would consider a friend. Uh, an example of this is a former vice president of Facebook um, who went on record to The Guardian earlier this year expressing deep regrets um, for the role he played in Facebook destroying the social fabric of our society um, because of all the harms that it does, uh, that it has done, um, as we have conclusively expressed throughout our case tonight. So to move on to the second theme of um, the, more technology, um, the more technological factors in question, uh, to address the first um, issue of clickbait that arose, uh, whilst the opposition's first speaker proposed that cross-referencing encourages a more um, academically savvy um, uh, society to, you know, to check up on the facts to make sure they're legitimate, we have to question the reality of this and, of course, um, keep in mind the initial impact of clickbait. A lot of it is the shock factor of seeing a headline that entices the individual to read it. Um, and whilst we would like to accept that uh, yes fact checking is required for any facts to be considered legitimate this there needs to be a burden again a burden of um a reliance placed on facebook to ensure that their news outlets and things that are being advertised as news are to some extent accurate they can't be um over shrouded in you know uh, made up stories fake news etc um, and we'd further like to build um, the sentiment that Facebook would in any way like to see the um, like to see these clickbait articles disappear. As um, as linking to a previous point about the Honest Ads Act, they spent three point one million dollars on lobbyists to ensure this act um, was not upheld in the in the U.S. Senate, and it is yet to be upheld, um, largely in due in part to their lobbying efforts. Um, so this again comes across in the privacy argument um, as they are once again spending large sums of money to ensure a lot of these issues are suppressed. Um, and just to, uh, just to address one final point that Facebook has made an initial mistake with Cambridge Analytica. Um, awareness needs to be drawn to the fact that Facebook was systematically cooperating with the NSA, um, the National Security Agency and the FBI within the United States of America through their prison programs which were identified by the 2014 um, leaks proposed by Edward Snowden. Um, in summary, ladies and gentlemen, we the negative team, uh, we the affirmative team, do not believe that we should be uh, that we sh believe that we should unfriend Facebook. Mm Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for tonight's debate is that we should unfriend Facebook. Tonight, I am the third speaker for the negative team 
we remain strongly opposed to the idea of, unfriend, of, of unfriending such an accomplished enterprise. Now, before I begin my team summary, I would first like to review some of our opposition's flawed arguments. The first affirmative speaker has stated that Facebook owns our data and because of this we should unfriend it. While this may be true that Facebook has access to small amounts of our data, the only data Facebook has on us is what we give it. So there is a simple solution, which is to provide Facebook with less information. Additionally, we need to understand that Facebook is a business at the end of the day and that they need to make profit. So, I don't see why there is any concern at all with Facebook owning our data so they can target appropriate adver 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 advertisements. Especially when signing up to Facebook, you must agree to collecting small amounts of data on you in their terms and conditions. Thus, this point from our opposition is quite insignificant and provides no reason to unfriend Facebook. The first affirmative speaker has also stated that Facebook is notorious for spreading fake news and because of this, we should unfriend it. This is wrong, ladies and gentlemen, because our opposition is trying to accuse Facebook for, sp for spreading the fake news. However, however, the fake news spreading really has nothing to do with Facebook. All Facebook has done is provide a platform where groups can post to the general public, and if one of these groups were to post something that is malicious, how could we possibly blame this, this on the platform? In fact, Facebook have established systems so that they can do their best to remove fake news. These are their flagging and dispute systems. This is because the posting of malevolent content is against Facebook's terms and conditions. In fact, when asked about this dilemma, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg responded, of all the content on Facebook, more than 99% of what people see is authentic. This clearly demonstrates that Facebook do not approve of fake news posted by their users on their platform and do everything in their power to remove it. Our opposition has stated that Facebook provides a platform where cyberbullying is common. This is wrong because unfortunately cyberbullying is present all over the internet and on multiple social media platforms. So in this argument, our opposition is making a false clause by assuming that Facebook causes cyberbullying, which is simply not the case. They used to say back in the day, don't shoot the messenger, but this clearly needs an update to nowadays situation. So don't shoot the platform the messages are sent on. The second affirmative speaker has stated that Facebook causes many other problems, including mental health problems, mainly depression and cyber crimes. This is wrong, once again, because our opposition is making a massive false cause fallacy, as Facebook does not cause these problems. Just because these problems have occurred on Facebook does not mean that Facebook causes them. If Facebook were unfriended, these issues would still exist on the internet. Thus, this entire argument is a blatant correlation, not causation, and is completely invalid in this debate. The third family speaker stated that Facebook needs more anti-cyberbullying action. I would just like to reiterate what our second speaker stated as they did explain an anti-cyberbullying anti action Facebook has taken recently. Last month, Facebook had an anti-cyberbullying day where all of the users were presented with anti-cyberbullying messages. Thus, Facebook are taking anti-cyberbullying action very recently. The third affirmative speaker also stated that Facebook needs to have a burden of reliability on many of the issues raised. We agree with the opposition on this one, that there must be a burden of reliability on Facebook, as our opposition was emphasising not that we should unfriend Facebook, but rather make them reliable, which we agree with. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the, opposition, the opposing team has dwelled mainly on the past with regard to the data leaks that occurred months ago and advertising systems from years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, my team tonight has dwelled with, a, with much more on the present and the future with Facebook's new machine learning systems to identify and cross-reference fake news and Facebook's new data collection policies. So ladies and gentlemen, it is quite clear that Facebook have learnt from their previous mistakes and are now changing their platform for the better. What is more significant to this debate, the mistakes that have happened in the past or the changes Facebook are making today to improve their platform for the people? Thus, there is no way Facebook should be unfriended. Now onto my summary of my team's case. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker tonight, Tom, already highlighted to you the fact that Facebook is a globally multifaceted network that helps to keep people connected and organised. Facebook helps to keep people organised by bringing them notifications when events are on, and additionally it can connect people all over the world, as you can talk to someone overseas in an instant. He then went on to his second point, which was that Facebook has helped our society by making young people more conscious of current social issues. 
This is because many young people hear about all of the current issues in society through Facebook. While this can be bad due to fake news, overall Facebook does do an excellent job of filtering the fake stories and providing teenagers with contemporary, interesting and accurate information. Our second speaker, Olivia, also brought up some compelling points tonight. Her first point, ladies and gentlemen, was that Facebook is useful in giving its users a platform to reach a wider audience. Facebook, as of 2018, is still the most effective way in reaching a large amount of people with a specific story. Facebook is actually such a useful tool when it comes to spreading the word. Many websites such as GoFundMe, Change.org and many other charity fundraisers have actually implemented systems that help their users share their stories on Facebook as it is such a dynamic platform. She then went on to explain about the Cambridge Analytica controversy and what Facebook have done since that scandal and what they are doing nowadays to ensure that nothing like this happens in the future. After this controversy, Facebook has been carefully redesigned to ensure that the settings and privacy menu are much more accessible and changeable, as this allows the people to have more control over the information they are giving to Facebook. Thus, Madam Chen, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion to my team's case tonight, I would like to emphasise that despite the fact that Facebook has made mistakes in the past, we need to remember to be forgiving, as when aiming for long-term success, failure is often inevitable. As Dennis Waitley once stated, failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Failure is defa d delay, not defeat. It's a temporary detour, not a dead end. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, Facebook have made mistakes in the past, however, through all their failures, they have strived to improve. Thus, there is no way we should consider unfriending Facebook. Thank you.